Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Albert. I am the Clatt Family Director for Public Programs here at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And I am very pleased to be here once again to moderate the third talk in our series of public lectures on the history of Jewish Messianism. While people are continuing to file in, I'll just make my, um, my few usual um, thanks and comments about how this hour will unfold. So first of all, uh, as always, we're very grateful to the Klatt family and to the Harry Stern Family Foundation, the Katz family, and the rest of our board of advisors, friends of the Katz Center, and other donors. Uh, your support really matters and we appreciate it. I also thank my colleagues here at the Cat Center working with me behind the scenes, um, including but not limited to Diana Dennis Walters, Brian Lipscomb, Miriam Saperstein, Natalie Dorman, and of course our director, Steve Weitzman. I will um, mention, as I always do, that this program is being recorded. Um, and along with our other public lectures in this series and our other series, it will be posted in a few days to the CAT Center's YouTube channel. The um, first video in this series um, from uh, the talk on Jewish Messianism at the time of early Christianity has been posted. So if you missed that or if you wanted to review it, it'll be there. Um, Tuesday's talk about um, El Dad Hadani will be up. Um, I think by Monday. Um, so just do have a look. Now, as we proceed, um, you will find that you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please feel free to submit questions there at any time during the lecture. And I will see them and I will do my best to, to relay at least the bulk of them to the speaker after the lecture. Now, today's program, um, as I said, is the third in this four-part series that's devoted to Jewish Messianism. Just for a quick review, um, the first talk was on um, Jewish Messianism in the time of early Christianity with Matthew Novenson from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, last week, or rather last two days ago, uh, we jumped ahead to a time and place that was distant from that ancient holy land to the appearance in the Middle Ages of a figure who claimed to be from the tribe of Dan, um, initiating this long lasting Jewish interest in the return of the 10 lost tribes, which then fed messianic narratives of Jewish political independence and restoration for a long time to come. Now we're jumping forward again, another half millennium to hear about some figures who made their own messianic claims were received as potential or pretended messiahs. And we'll learn about how they were received in a newly mobile and new, newly interconnected early modern Europe. Next week, we'll conclude this whirlwind tour across uh, Jewish history with uh, some attention to Shabtai Tzvi, probably the, the most famous Jewish messianic figure whose movement began in the early modern period, but then really bridged into, into modernity and its aftermath. So with that framing, uh, I'll move to today. So today's speaker um, very happily is Rebecca Voss coming to us from Goethe University. Hi, Rebecca, in Frankfurt, Germany, where she is an associate professor of Judaic studies. In her illustrious career, uh, she has held fellowships and teaching positions at Bar Ilan University, at Harvard as a Harry Starr Fellow in Judaica, at YIVO and Columbia University, at the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, and of course, at, here at the Cat Center, the, the crown, the, the, the jewel in her crown. Um, her research focuses on Jewish cultural history in early modern Europe with a particular interest in cultural transfer between Jews and Christians. And those of us, those of you who were here on Tuesday will note that there's some commonality there with what uh, Professor Micha Perry works on. Of the four books she's written and edited, two are in English and you might be interested in them. Um, she co-edited a collection of essays called Peoples of the Apocalypse, Eschatological Beliefs and Political Scenarios. Uh, again, you can hear the connections to things we've been talking about in this series, and most relevant to today, her 2021 monograph, Disputed Messiahs, 
Jewish and Christian messianism in the Ashkenazic world during the Reformation. Um, and that was from Wayne State University Press. And at some point, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat so you can find it if you're interested. That book looks at how Jewish and Christian messianic ideology and politics were linked and shows how Jews and Christians reacted to each other's claims and beliefs and adapted their views accordingly. And I think we'll probably hear at least some about that as part of this, this talk today. So um, Rebecca, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks, Anne, for this uh, kind introduction. And I will share my screen. OK, I hope it's working. Early modern Europe, with its revolutionary events and dramatic political, social, religious, and cultural upheavals, offered fertile ground for messianic expectations. The Reformation and wars against the Ottoman Turks, European geographical expansion, astrological events, and natural catastrophes, all these were seen as the omens of the approaching end of the world and the coming of the Messiah. The doctrine of the last days and its contemporary interpretations experienced a surge of popular interest. Classical works in the apocalyptic tradition were copied, commented on, and printed, where new prophetic texts became international bestsellers. Apocalyptic prophets and messianic pretenders enjoyed an eager audience for the message, at once frightful and hopeful. Jews and Christians often interpreted these historical events and celestial wonders in similar ways. What's more, each group ascribed to the other a cosmic role in their respective apocalyptic scenarios. Therefore, both the Jews and Christians followed messianic news in the other religious group very closely, as we are going to see today. One of the largest Jewish messianic phenomena of the early modern period occurred in the 1520s and 30s, when two self-professed Jewish messiahs toured Europe and garnered wide attention in both the Jewish and the Christian world. And I'm speaking of the scintillating figures of David Rouveni and Shlomo Mochel. David Rouveni first appeared in the Middle East and then in Europe, claiming to be an emissary from the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel sent to help liberate the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks. His mission, in which he was eventually supported by Solomon Mochel, a former conversor from Portugal, caused the resurgence of Jewish hopes for an imminent return to Jerusalem, one of the central events, as you know, expected to occur when the Messiah comes. For a short time, Rouveni received encouragement even from the most powerful European authorities. The Pope praised the plan, as did the King of Portugal, who promised military aid. Charles V, King of Spain and the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of German nations, granted Rouveni and Mochel an audience, while whether granted an audience at which they were arrested and eventually condemned to death. In my lecture today, I would like to explore why Rouveni and Mochel were causing such a furor among both Jews and Christians. What were their goals? and background, and who were the followers and who were the opponents? And what, I want to ask in the end, does this case teach us about early modern Jewish messianism? In 1523, a certain David Rouveni appeared on the scene, claiming to have come from the so-called 10 lost tribes of Israel. After part of the Israelite population that had inhabited ancient Israel's Northern Kingdom, was led into exile by the conquering Assyrians in the 8th century BCE, the Jewish myth arose about a return of these lost tribes. According to the popular legend, the 10 lost tribes were cut off from the rest of the world by the Sambatium River. During the six days of the week, the ranging waters and tumbling debris make the Sambatium impassable, while on the Sabbath, the waters rest. But the laws of the Sabbath forbid the, forbid the Jews from crossing them. Thus, the 10 tribes remain trapped until the Messianic age when God will quell the roaring of the Sambation so that the 10 tribes may cross over unharmed. During the Middle Ages, the 10 tribes acquired a military hero image and the expectation began to take root that they would represent the Messiah's army who was to finally liberate the people of Israel from domination under Christendom and Islam. Among Jews in Germany, 
the ten tribes were known as the Red Jews in Yiddish, and they were seen no less as apocalyptic avengers than as messianic saviors. The centrality of the motif of eschatological revenge on Christians and Ashkenazic thought was known to Christians who were familiar with the imaginary people of the Red Jews. In fact, in Christian images of the millennial scenario, the Red Jews had a nearly identical function as in the Jewish concept. Here too, the assumption was that this fearsome horde would descend upon Christian Europe in the end times. Christians in Germany were thus trembling, trembling with horror at the destructive power of the Red Jews, where Jews expected them eagerly. In the medieval and early modern periods, this image of the Ten Tribes of the Red Jews figured prominently in the eschatological scenario for both Jews and Christians. And from time to time, it was rumored that the Messianic army, in light of the oppression of their brothers and sisters in the diaspora, was already arming itself for the fight. It therefore comes at no surprise that David Ruvaini fascinated the world for a decade when he said he was the brother of the king who ruled over part of the Ten Tribes, namely his own tribe of Reuben, as well as Gad and half of the tribe of Menashe. The kingdom, he said, lay east of the Red Sea in the heart of the Arabian Peninsula. Writing of his travels, Ruvaini tells of crossing the Red Sea to Nubia and then Egypt and finally arriving in the land of Israel. He had been sent, he claimed, to lead the Jews back from exile. We find some of the earliest news of Rovani's activities in widespread reports in German language pamphlets on the military advance of the Ten Tribes. Hebrew correspondence confirms and supplements the information of these pamphlets regarding the impact that this first, less well-known part of Rovani's travels prior to his arrival in Europe had upon his contemporaries. According to his own testimony, Rovani came first to Cairo in 1523. Immediately upon arrival, he sought out the Egyptian mint master, Abraham de Castro, to reveal a mystery to him. In all likelihood, this revelation involved details about the coming redemption and the role that the lost tribes were to play. De Castro, however, firmly rejected the self-proclaimed Messiah. The failure of his mission in Egypt may be the reason Rubaini passes over this episode with relative brusqueness in his travelogue. Concerning his further adventures in the Middle East, we learn next to nothing from Rubaini himself. After he left Egypt, he traveled through the region as a pilgrim to visit the graves of, pa of the patriarchs in Hebron and the holy sites in Jerusalem. Rubaini claims to have used the power of prayer at the Western Wall to cause the half moon atop the Dome of the Rock to bow down toward the east, much to the horror of the Muslims. From Galilee, Ruveni traveled on to Damascus, another center, the Ottoman province of Syria, to which Jerusalem also belonged. Whether in fact the Jewish delegation ever reached the court in Istanbul and was received by the Sultan cannot be known with any certainty. Nevertheless, Two German pamphlets relay the, humors, uh, the, the rumors surrounding the appearance of such a commission at the court of Suleiman the Magnificent. The editor of the pamphlet concerning a great multitude and host of Jews relates that the 12 delegates demanded the return of the land of their fathers from the Turkish occupiers and admonished the Sultan, quote, to return to, to, return to them their ancient and ancestral homeland that is the promised land. If he should do so, the Jews were prepared to conquer this land by force of arms." End quote. At the date of the pamphlet's printing, the Sultan's answer had not yet been given. In the meantime, according to the pamphlet's testimony, quote, a great multitude and host of Jews, more precisely as many as five or six hundred thousand, have arrived in the land of Egypt and made camp 30 days march from Jerusalem in the Negev desert. And yet this powerful force was only vanguard. It would be followed by warriors without number. One heard, quote, that now the tribes like the sand of the sea and stars of the sky are making ready to come. It was expected the armies would join, would join in battle in only a few days. 
Such was the supposed situation on the apocalyptic front in summer 1523, after Rouveni had made his peregrination about the Middle East, announcing the imminent fall of Islam. By December at the latest, however, it was clear that the Turks would not be willing to lead withdraw from the land of Israel. As the pamphlet informs us, quote, since it had been their fathers and was given to them by God, he was willing to sell it to them, to which the Jews retorted, God gave it to them, they would not buy it, but, by the, that it would, that, but they would win it back by the sword, end, end quote. Toward the end of the same year, 1523, Rouveni found himself on the way to Europe in hopes of persuading the Christians into an alliance against the Muslims and with their help of reconquering Jerusalem. To be sure, a Jewish military alliance would be also of interest to the Europeans, many as they were and had been repeatedly by the Turks. At the beginning of December 1523, in Alexandria, Rouveni embarked on a ship bound for Venice to begin his tour diplomatique. And in fact, with his offer to lead the army of his brother along with the soldiers of Christ against the Turks, he at first found a receptive audience among, among the most powerful of Europe. As early as February 1524, he was received by Pope Clement VII. The audience of a representative, a representative of the 10 tribes of the leader of Christendom was doubtless a sensation in the Jewish world, since according to the medieval Jewish scholar Nachmanides, the Messiah, already connected with Rome in the Talmud and the Midrashim, would journey to the Pope to pro proclaim his messiahship. Just as Moses sought out Pharaoh prior to the exodus from Egypt, at the end of time, the Messiah, under God's command, would step before the Pope and demand of him, let my people go. Rouveni appears to have performed another curious sign in Rome. According to his own rather cryptic remarks before entering the city, he purchased an ox and proceeded as instructed by the 70 elders of his people. Presumably, he had done before, as he had done before at the central site of um, Islam in Jerusalem, in the Christian capital, he prophesied the fall of Christianity the second archetypal enemy of Israel. After all, in rabbinical literature, the eschatological ox, behemoth, is already identified typologically with Christendom. Perhaps this was to be the final sign of the Messiah, the sign for which the 10 tribes were waiting before continuing their advance. Ruveni apparently wished to bring about the quick destruction of both Edom and Ishmael, Christianity and Islam, by entangling Christian and Muslims in a war of mutual annihilation. His diplomatic efforts had in this sense a clear ulterior motif and apocalyptic intention. By provoking the eschatological wars be between Gog and Magog embodied in Christianity and Islam respectively, he sought to fulfill the prerequisite for the restitution of Israel. While Rouveni was still making his way to Europe, the rumor had already begun to spread in Germany, according to the pamphlets I mentioned before, that, quote, the emperor of the Turks, that is the Sultan, and the Red Jews have now resorted to fight, to arms to fight for the promised land. In his messianic war against the Turks, David Ruveni hoped for confederation with the powerful Charles V, king of Spain and emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. After all, the empire stood at that time under immediate threat by the Turks, and thus Charles would have had good reason to lend a favorable ear to Rouveni's offer of Jewish military aid. By the time Rouveni visited the Pope in 1524, he had come to see it as a matter of great importance that the two traditional nations of the Crusades, Germany and France, set aside the differences regarding the domination of Europe and taking, take action against, instead, against a common Turkish enemy. Because a reconciliation between Charles V and Francis I of France did not stand in his own interests, however, the Pope referred Rouveni to the Portuguese king of Portugal, to the Portuguese king, John III, 
whose fleet at that time was the dominant sea power in Arabia. John III received Rouven in the autumn of the following year and promised him the military support he desired. It was during this time, according to Rouven's own testimony, that the emperor heard of his mission and had him informed through an ambassador that he approved of Rouveni's plan and wished to see him. Years were to pass, however, before a meeting could take place. In Portugal, Rouveni found himself for the first time in difficulties that earned him John's disfavor. The cause was messianic unrest among the conversos, the Iberian Jews, or their descendants, who were forced to convert. In a country that since 1497 had tolerated no Jews within its borders, the appearance of the alleged Jewish prince and emissary of the lost tribes, not to mention his former reception by the king, had occasioned a certain amount of civil commotion. Very quickly, accusations began to circulate that the emissary was seeking to call the conversos back to their Jewish faith. A fatal moment in this context was the open declaration by a young converso at the royal court, a scribe by the name of Diogo Pires, that he had returned to the Judaism of his parents. Ruveni denied that he, had any, that he had had anything to do with the matter or that he was even interested in the fate of the conversos. Nevertheless, the Portuguese king revoked his offer of military aid and toward the end of 1526 banished Ruveni from his kingdom. From that moment on, an evil star seemed to rule over Rouveni's destiny. The ship that was to bring him back to Italy was instead forced by unfavorable winds to drop anchor on the east coast of Spain, where Rouveni and his entire retinue were placed under arrest since Jews were forbidden to set foot in any of the territories of the Spanish crown. Although Charles, as territory ruler, ultimately granted free passage, Rouveni did not manage to see the emperor face to face. Once again in Italy, and after various other setbacks, large and small, Rouveni began to concentrate his efforts on the possibility of meeting with the emperor. In February 1530, he traveled to Bologna to take part, part in Charles's coronation festivities. His hopes for an audience with the emperor were baffled yet again, however, However, Rouveni refused to give up his ambitions. Some two and a half years later, in the summer of 1532, he journeyed north to Regensburg in Germany, where the emperor had recently held the imperial diet. He was accompanied on this journey by the erstwhile scribe Hugo Pires, who since his reconversion to Judaism had remained himself Shlomo Mocho. Having initially fled to the Ottoman Empire to avoid the Portuguese Inquisition, Mocho had, by the time of his reunion with Rouveni in Italy, become a prominent mystic and had even earned messianic notoriety, notori notoriety through a series of apocalyptic sermons. Although Rouveni must be considered the initiator of the expedition to Regensburg, at some point, during the sojourn in Germany, he stepped into a secondary role and handed the active diplomacy over to Mocho. The reasons for this are not entirely clear. Mocho, we know, received an imperial audience in Regensburg. Whether Rouveni was also present at this meeting with the emperor remains unclear. Mocho placed before Emperor Charles V the prospect of Jewish support in his war against the Ottomans. The sources indicate that Mocho made no reference to the armies of Rouveni's royal brother, whereas Rouveni himself in his negotiations with the Pope and the Portuguese king had made constant mention of them. This is in line with a role reversal that seems to have occurred between the two men. Rouveni's identity now remained in the background. Whence the Jewish soldiers were to come, if not from the lost tribes, can be gleaned from the famous Jewish politician and Stadtlan, Joslov Rosheim, who was in Regensburg for the occasion of the imperial diet. In his chronicle, Joslov notes that Mocho's intention was, quote, to stir up the emperor by telling him that he had come together all the Jews, and we may assume the Jews of Europe, to wage war against the Turks, end quote. 
As Mofo himself claimed afterward, the emperor had listened to him for two hours with great interest and had asked him many questions. In a situation in which support against the Turks was des desperately needed, it was perhaps understandable that the emperor would welcome any even remotely plausible support. Morocco's proposal of a second front against the Muslims, in fact, offered an attractive prospect in the summer of 1520, uh, 1532. Although the emperor's brother, Ferdinand I, had succeeded in driving the Turks from Austria in 1529, parts of Hungary, including the city of Buda, had remained in their position, possession. Even as Romania and Morfo were arriving in Regensburg, the Turks were busy preparing for a renewed assault on the empire. In spring 1532, Suleiman had departed from Istanbul at the head of a massive army. Gradually, a two-pronged attack began to take shape. The foot soldiers under the Sultan's leadership marched on Hungary and the empire, while on the other hand, the Turkish fleet would attack Southern Italy. Moreover, the Turks threatened to renew their siege of Vienna. In response, the Imperial Diet in Regensburg, which had opened but a few days before the Turkish army decamped, placed, placed the Turkish threat and the preparation of the counterattack at the top of its agenda. Under these precarious circumstances, the military aid offered by the Jewish delegation was urgently needed. And it is no surprise that the suggestion of a Jewish Jewish-Christian military alliance was taken into serious consideration. The proposed mutual Christian-Jewish campaign against the Turks did not materialize. Instead, only a day after the audience, Mohan and Rovani were arrested and led before the Justice of Peace. The reasons for their failure as messianic activists have been comprehensively laid out by the historian Chava Frankel Goldschmidt. On the basis of current knowledge, however, certain connections that were merely suspected before can now be given co concrete form. As Frankel Goldschmidt has shown through an analysis of letters to the Vatican from the papal envoy Girolamo Aleanda, Aleanda himself played a significant role in the arrest of Molfo and Rouveni. From the very beginning, he left no room for doubt as to his own stance toward Mofo, whom he viewed as a backsliding converso and a heretic. Already years before, he had advocated in Rome for Mofo's execution, as provided in the laws of the Inquisition for anyone who fell away from the Catholic faith. The judgment failed to be enforced at the time, however, due to the Pope's personal intervention. As a consequence, Aleander now expressed himself forcefully against any support of Morfo's intention. Apart from the fact that for Aleander, any form of traffic with a heretic was simple out of the question to begin with, he also considered the prospect of a Christian Jewish crusade to be a disgrace for the church. Regardless of the outcome of such an undertaking, it could be only to the disadvantage of both the church and Christendom itself. Quote, then, writes Aleander, if we are victorious, the world will be scandalized by the fact that the victory is credited to Morfo and to his being a Jew. And if we are defeated in battle, this will be credited to his majesty and to all the Christians." End quote. Frankel Goldschmidt has pointed toward another factor that likely contributed to the sudden change of fortune for the two emissaries the fear of stirring up messianic furor among Jews and conversos, as well as in Christian chiliastic circles. In fact, the 1520s and 30s saw the high watermark of messianic expectation among the conversos. As mentioned earlier, Rouveni's appearance in Portugal had led to an open rebellion among them. Perhaps we can assume this lay nearer to the Spaniard Charles's heart than all other developments within the empire. Yet, for his German advisors in Regensburg, the mood among the imperial populace was doubtless the crucial factor. The sudden unrest of Mohan Rouveni in Regensburg comes as no surprise when one considers that Christians in the empire feared Jewish messianism 
and in particular, the arrival of the red juice as a threat to life and limb. We wanted to protect oneself from this very real and present danger by any means available. Without a doubt, the idea of arming Jews and training them as soldiers, as Mohawk proposed in Regensburg, would have been deeply unsetting for many Christian contemporaries. Even though Mohawk assured his Christian interlocutors that he wanted only to support them in, his, in their struggle against the Ottomans, such protestations could hardly lessen the chronic fear of apocalyptic Jewish revenge. After all, that same fear had been shaping Christian perception for centuries. One of the German dukes actually present in Regensburg at the time confirms that Mohol's activities came to an end in Regensburg, quote, from fear of a Jewish rebellion. Nor did the self-confident and dramatic entrance of Mohol to Ravenia into Regensburg do much to dispel the Christian nightmare of the apocalypse. For one thing, the delegation itself seems to have been rather numerous. The emissaries were apparently accompanied by an entourage, including various persons, servants, and other Jews who had spontaneously joined the group. Perhaps more alarming still was the appearance of the two Jewish emissaries themselves. Mohamed Rouveni bore provocative emblems of Jewish sovereignty. According to a Christian report, they were armed with swords and shields that had been sanctified with the names of God in Hebrew. The shield reported by one source to have been a Rouveni's possession was alleged to have belonged to King David who used it to fight the battles of the Lord. Above all, however, what lent the delegation the appearance of official diplomatic, diplomatic status and enhanced dignity were the banners they carried with them as signs of the 10 tribes, icons that had already caused a sensation in Italy and Portugal. According to Rouveni, the Jewish troops would bear the same colors in the future war. One of the flags that Mocho carried with him in Regensburg is preserved, and you see it here on the slides, is preserved in the Jewish Museum in Prague. Shaped like a divided triangle and fashioned from yellow silk bordered by a tricolored silk fringe, it bears quotes in Hebrew on both sides, mostly from the Psalms embroidered in silk thread in two different shades of red. If one had wished to have Mohor and Rouveni condemned to death for sedition, it would have sufficed merely to translate the Bible verses adorning this flag. And we are doing exactly this now. And we will see a messianic military program is expressed here without ambiguity, linking the hope for imminent salvation to the downfall of the non-Jewish nations. The God of vengeance is entreated using the familiar old shfoch from the liturgy of the Passover Seder to destroy the enemies of Israel. Pour out your fury on the nations that do not know you upon the kingdoms that do not evoke your name. O pursue them in wrath and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. O God of retribution, Lord, God of retribution, appear. He subjects peoples to us, sets nations at our feet. Finally, now, the suffering of Israel under Christian rule is to be avenged. Strike fear into them, O Lord, let the nations know they are only men. Give us joy for as long as you have afflicted us for the years we have suffered misfortune. Appropriately, the one quote that does, does not come from the Bible, but rather from the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, which was approaching when Rouveni and Mohu were in Regensburg, proclaims the God of Israel, king over the entire world. Quote, the eternal one is king, was king, and shall always be king and eternal. God reigns over the nations. God is seated in his holy throne. Under the guise of esoteric insinuation, the arrangement of the quotes informs us as to God's means of preparing for his reign and of casting down the other nations. On the reverse side of the flag, all verses embroidered in dark thread begin with the letter Shin, the three in the middle, even with Shin and Mem, Solomon Mohol's initials. Thus, the two closing verses likely refer to Mohol himself and to his divine calling as military commander on the model of King David. 
the two final verses are selected from David's song of thanksgiving after a victorious battle against his enemies. Quote, who trained my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. I pursued my enemies and wiped them out. I did not turn back till I destroyed them, end quote. A banner belonging to Moho that is now lost apparently expressed a similar, similarly warlike spirit. It is reported that its Hebrew inscription read Maccabi. Read as an acrostic of Exodus 15 verse 11, what we find here, on the other hand, what we find here is on the one hand, trust and salvation. The verse reads, who is like you, O Lord, among the celestials? And on the other hand, it refers to the heroic figure of Judah Maccabi, the famous insurrectionist in the rebellion against the Hasmoneans, against the rule of the Seleucids, which finally led the renewed independence of Ju to the renewed independence of Judah in the second century BCE. Judah Maccabi appears here as Moho's role model, it seems. The context of perceived danger in which the arrest of Ravenian Moho played out presumably included a trial that deeply marked the public imagination in the early 1530s throughout the empire. The authorities could scarcely have forgotten now a mere two years earlier the supposed Jewish-Turkish conspiracy to overthrow the Habsburgs at the end of the days that had been exposed in the trial against an Anabaptist sect. Against this background, how could one be expected to lend credence to Mohon Roveni to subscribe to their plan to lead the Jews into battle against their own proven confederates? Even the mere mention of Jews and Turks in the same context must have awakened unpleasant associations. In 1532, the allegation that the Jews were in league with the Turks could hardly be entirely def defeated by a dubious offer of Jewish military to support. The same accusation was made, to, was made again and again the following years. Moreover, in the 16th century, the image of the dangerous red Jews still overshadowed their newer reputation as a potentially useful ally. In fact, throughout the century, the outright identification of the Red Jews with the Turks is not difficult to trace. The temporary proximity to the Anabaptist case also played a role in Joslav Rosheim's choice to distance himself from Opa and Rovani. For Joslav, the idea of recruiting Jews to serve in the war against the Turks was completely unacceptable, and to submit such a proposal to the emperor was not appropriate to their situation in an often hostile Christian environment. According to his own testimony, he asked Mocho in a letter to stand down from his plan. And as Mocho entered the city, Yossel himself hastily departed, quote, he writes in his chronicle, so that the emperor should not say that I had a hand in his strange plans. Yossel rightly feared that the systematic arming of Jews could only appear suspicious to the authorities and hence could have direful consequences for the Jewish communities whose situation in the empire was difficult enough already. After all, Yossel had only shortly before been forced to intervene against the threat of reprisals in the wake of the Anabaptist case. Thus, Yossel had immediate knowledge of the potential consequences of acute messianic hopes and activity in the face of a negative perception within the Christian environment. Therefore, his political activities, in his political activities, he was guided by the practical imperative of avoiding danger, regardless of his own personal belief that the advent of the Messiah was indeed close at hand. As far as we know, the Jews in the empire suffered no serious consequences from the visit by Solomon Molho and David Ruveni to Regensburg. Such consequences reserved, were reserved only for the two emissaries themselves. The decisive reason why in the end Ruveni and Molho were arrested may well once again have been purely pragmatic and with an eye to the cause of the war against the Turks in Hungary. Shortly before, the Sultan had given up the siege without success and returned to Istanbul. Moreover, the imperial fleet had in the meantime defeated the Turks by the sea. 
With this, the offer of Jewish support against the common foe had lost its urgency, and the reasons for rendering him and his companions harmless could now unfold to their full effect. Such an interpretation finds support in the portrayal by the historiographer Joseph Cohen. After the Jewish emissaries had already been in detention for several days, Cohen writes, quote, the emperor saw when the Turk withdrew that the situation had relaxed and he departed from the city. He returned to Italy and let them, Ruven and Mojo, chain two wagons to Mantua with him, end quote. There in the same year, Romojo was burned at the stake as a heretic. Roveni was led in chains to Spain and cast into the dungeons of the Inquisition. He too made his end at the stake. During their arrest, Roveni and Mojo were relieved of their belongings. While the shield that Roveni carried with him likely ended up in Bologna and was apparently preserved there in a synagogue till the end of the 17th century, Mojo's effects seem to have come into the possession of the Jewish community in Prague in the 1540s, where they were acquired by the influential Horowitz family, builders of the Pinker Synagogue. Gjomtov Lippmann Heller, who was rabbi of Prague in the 17th century, remarked that, quote, near the holy community of Prague, the Pinker Synagogue, to which I came regularly, even before my appointment as head of the rabbinic court, there is a silken talit katan of a greenish color like an egg yolk. And also the richer fringes are silk and of the same color. It was brought here from Regensburg and belonged to the holy rabbi Solomon Molho, may the Lord avenge his blood. Moreover, two banners from him and also his sanghanas, which one calls a kitten, end quote. In addition to Molho's kittel and talit katan, his valuable coat, fashioned of fine sand-colored linen and adorned with embroiders, embroideries, also ended up in Prague. Beside the flag described earlier, this coat is the second item that survives and is likewise preserved in the Jewish Museum in Prague. Of the fate of the remaining objects, nothing is known. For at least 150 years, a regular messianic martyr cult bearing all the characteristics of Christian saint worship existed in Prague around Moho. A letter by an anonymous writer from Vienna to his father-in-law sent amid, amid the messianic enthusiasm surrounding Chapter Zwi in 1666 reports on the handling of the relics. The author describes how Moho's possessions were preserved in the immediate vicinity of the holiest place in the Pinker synagogue within the walled off area by the Torah cabinet. Every year on Simchat Torah, the custom was to present not only the Torah scrolls, but also the garment of the martyr, the garments of the martyr, for adoration by the community. They were laid upon the table in the synagogue, and children and women went to look at the garments. Only the Talit Katan was not exhibited, because holy names were embroidered upon it in silk. These names were scattered and disjointed and were not connected with each other. Moreover, the magical power of the divine names of this garment could harm those who used them in the wrong way. It's written in this letter, quote, namely, when the community beetle once attempted to copy out these names, he was struck blind. Also, the Gaon of the Holy Community of Prague, our teacher, the master Rabbi Lippmann, author of, of Tosford Yonto, who during the time in which he was chief justice in the holy community of Prague, relying upon his own piousness, sought to copy out the names. His piousness saved him from being injured, but nevertheless, his scribes, paper and inkwell were consumed and vanished from sight in such a manner that no one knows to this day where they went. Therefore, the chief justice determined that upon threat of banishment, no one should ever again be allowed to approach and attempt to read the names or copy them out." End quote. Since that time, no one dared come near enough to examine the holy names on Mojo's prayer rope. It was also expressly forbidden to copy out the names and above all to attempt to put them together to make sense out of them. But in the year 1666, however, something utterly astonishing had happened in Prague. 
as the writer of the letter claims to have learned. In a mysterious way, the names had combined themselves in 1666 into a Kabbalistic formula, according to which redemption was to begin that very year with Shabtai Tzvi as the Messiah. As the letter demonstrates, more than a hundred years after the demise of Ravani and Moho, the unique cult surrounding their relics could be renewed and reactivated with messianic significance. Indeed, it is typical for Jewish messianic movements in the early modern period that the fact that messianic prognostizations went unrealized did not necessarily discredit them as meaningless error. Neither a failed prophet nor a failed messiah was invariably publicly denounced as a charlatan. In our case, both the Jewish and Christian world resisted calling David Ruvani an imposter. If the 10 tribes still existed somewhere, it was certainly possible that one of the princes had indeed appeared. In an age without identity cards and birth certificates, one was keenly aware of the limitations on any possibility of obtaining reliable information as to a person's identity. For this reason, we can observe a relatively unconstrained interaction by contemporary standards with persons whose credibility was less than completely certain. In the absence of absolute certainty, neither Jews nor European rulers wished simply to dismiss Ruveni and Mohol's claims as mere fabrications. Despite substantial doubts, they finally could not ignore the possibility of help against the Ottoman Turks and the prospect of a messianic return to Jerusalem, respectively. The worst case scenario was that one would have dealt with the wrong person. Early modern messianism as a rule is characterized by simultaneous apocalyptic excitement and political practicism. Uh, pragmatism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. There is so much to think about and process in this story. Uh, and we already have a number of questions um, posted and I'll just encourage people to post more if they're if they still have. I think a few of the questions that were posted early on have been answered as you went along. Um, I wanna start with some questions that are probably ones that you get often that people have posted that are about um, sort of just the, the, the realism, the sort of difficult to understand realism and pragmatism of, of this plan. Like from us, from where we're sitting, it seems very fantastical. Right. So people say people ask multiple times in the in the Q and A, how why did Christians take him seriously? Why was this viewed as a real possibility? Right. And so I want to kind of put that to you, and also ask you to maybe take that as an opportunity to expand a little bit on what we know, if anything, about where Ruvani really came from, who he was, what he was after, and what his actual ability to do things might have been. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, um, because you're right, from our point of view, if somebody comes into your office and says, I come from the Ten Lost Tribes, you probably won't believe him. But um, in the early modern period, the Ten Lost Tribes were perceived like any other nation, like a military um, force that existed somewhere in the world. And we have maps um, from the from the 15th and the 16th century that map exactly where we can we could find the 10 tribes and not only Jews but also Christians and I think um, Micha Perry uh, spoke about it uh, on Tuesday they they knew for them it was not a belief but the but a knowledge that those 10 tribes existed um, so so this is the background that we need to understand in order to um, to see why Charles V and, 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 and the Pope, why they believed Rovani. Um, and as I said, also, they were desperate to, to find any support against the Ottomans. So they would like try to find um, any, any possibility. Um, 
and as and as for the for the background of Rouveni, there has been a lot of speculation. Um, some researchers thought that he might have been a Jew from Sephardic descent. Others say that he could have been an Ashkenazic Jew. Um, others say that he came from the Arabian Peninsula. So in the end, we we cannot know. Um, I mentioned his travelogue that um, that uh, we have. It's a it's a travelogue written in Hebrew, um, and there he styled himself being a, a Jew from the from 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 the Arabian Peninsula. That he only spoke Hebrew and Arabic. So, but again, it's his own words, so we don't know. And there's been a lot of a um, lot of work to try to determine what what his identity was, but there's no solution, it's still unclear. So standing from where we are, from where we're standing again, it seems like fairly clear that he wasn't really coming from the Lost Tribes, right? So do we want to call him, so you, you pointed out that the Christians at the time didn't want to call him an imposter. Would we want to call him an imposter? In other words, was he a swindler with some kind of um, plan to 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 get something from the Christian leadership or from the Jews of Europe aside from this proposal that he pretended to be making? Or does it seem as though he really had the aim of retaking the Holy Land and trying to get Christian political support for that project? Right. Yeah, I, I think. I, I... I think he did. So this is why I would not call him a swindler or an imposter, because even if if he didn't come from the ten tribes, which uh, seems kind of clear, that then he it, he basically instrumentalized, like he, he took this opportunity to to present himself as somebody from the ten lost tribes to to um, to initiate the coming of the Messiah. So this is why. I'm always hesitant to call those people like failed messiahs or to call him an imposter. Right, okay, so that actually leads to the next question that a couple of people have asked is, did these figures specifically call themselves messiahs? Um, where is uh, messianism per se? Obviously these are messianic stories, right? The idea of a restoration of Jewish political independence, especially in the Holy Land, um, fits right into that narrative. but. Did they understand themselves as either prophets of a coming Messiah or as messianic figures themselves, or is it really a, a kind of political movement and rebellion that that we would put into that tradition? I think it's both. I think like messianism can never be separated from political goals, something that's happening on the political stage, um, and in the case of Rovania and Moho. Again, it's like it's been disputed whether Rouveni understood himself as Messiah Ben David or Messiah um, Ben Joseph, but it seems that because he claimed to, to, be, to be the commander of the force of the Ten Lost Tribes, that he may have understood himself as Messiah, um, the, the first Messiah Ben Joseph, son of Joseph, who would prepare with the Messianic army the way for Messiah Ben David um, and during the battles would fall. So it seems from his writing and other um, testimonies we have that he understood himself as a Messiah Ben, uh, at least as a messianic figure, either way, Messiah Ben David or um, Ben Joseph. And the same goes for Raveni. There's also, um, there's a wonderful book by um, Moti Ben Mele on uh, Shlomo Molcho came out a few years ago and um, he he also understood himself as a as a messianic figure and um, so definitely yes and then did the christian interlocutors see them in those terms right at the most of the way that you told the story is that the christians were being possibly opportunistic and being very pragmatic about what kind of uh, uh, you know real world implications there might be in arming Jews or making alliances with them. How did 
the Christian response connect with Christian traditions of messianic expectation, including but not limited to legends of the lost tribes, right? So yeah. that's a great question because there was a, at that time, the 1520s and 30s, there was a prophecy about Charles V, a Christian prophecy, seeing Charles V at the so-called last world emperor, basically the, the emperor who would defeat the Muslims and then usher in a golden age before Jesus would come back. And that fit right into, like, into the scheme to, to get support against the Muslims would, um, would be nurtured by, by Rouveni's um, activities. And um, some, of the, some of the people he met in Rome, we know that they were believers in this, in this prophecy about Charles V. So I think, again, it's like, it's this intertwining between political pragmatism on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, messianic or millennial expectations within the Jewish world and the Christian world. And of course, they were not the same, but each side tried to take, tried to, Try, try to read Ravani and Moho in there within the framework of their own scenarios. Given all of that, it's it's almost it's so striking that it didn't work out, right? There was a moment that all of these things came together, an alliance could have been made. Um, and so it's a, really this sort of dramatic inflection point. Yeah, certainly. And I, I, and as I said, it's it's again, it's 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 pragmatism because uh, then the, the Turks went back to Istanbul, so it wasn't that urgent to get anybody's help at that point. So yes. That's that's incredible. All right, with the couple of minutes remaining, there, there are also a few questions um, that got added towards the end after you started talking about the, the relics, um, which is something that I had, didn't know about at all. It's very interesting. Um, one person is asking just for clarification, and maybe you can talk about a little more. Did you say that the flag that's now in Prague was originally one of a set of 10, like one for each tribe? Or so did it represent one of the tribes? Or was it a sort of an overarching, um, you know, battle flag? Right, there, there were more than one flag. Um, at least more at least had two and Rouven at least one, but then no, that he had more even, but they are lost, but they were there, there's never been any knowledge about uh, one flag for each tribe. It was just Mothos flag and Rovenis flag representing the entire people of Israel and the Tendos tribes, especially. Okay, thank you. And then outside of Prague, do we know of other Jewish communities that continue to venerate, um, with or without you know, objects, but continue to venerate these figures for long after their death and the end of the of the moment of possibility that we've heard about. Yeah, we know, as I said, that some of the uh, Rovenis relics came to Bologna, but we don't know, we don't really know what happened to them after the 17th century. And the cult in Prague, it was known all outside Prague because the letter that I quoted was sent to somebody in Vienna. And we also have, have a testimony that uh, Jews in Damascus knew about this, um, this cult. So I don't know if like people also made pilgrimage to Prague to the to those relics. This I don't know, but uh, it's entirely possible. How much of a sense do you have um, of you know one of the things we'll, we'll hear when we hear from when we hear about Shabbat Tzvi in in a week and a half, we'll hear about you know large sort of masses like a popular movement surrounding that Messiah. Do you have a sense of there being a widespread popular? amassing of, of support and spiritual enthusiasm about, about um, Mulho and Ruveni. How, how extensive, how limited was it? Um, I think it was an essential movement because in, like in all um, depictions about Messianic movements from the early modern period, this event is mentioned. Um, and also we know about Jews um, doing penance in Germany, especially um, because of, of the activity of Shlomo Mocha and David Ruveni. And also like when they went before the, uh, before, the, before the emperor, it seemed to be a rather large gathering of Jews. Um, so I would say it's like the three large messianic movements of the early modern period, of course, Shabtai Tzvi and uh, 
David Ruvani and uh, Shlomo Mocha and also Asher Lemlein in the beginning of the 16th century. So like Ruvani and Mocha are definitely one of those three. And we won't even hear about Asher Lemlein. So we'll have to just plant that as a seed for people to go and find out for themselves because we do need to wrap up now. Um, I wanna thank you again, Rebecca. Um, this is such fascinating material and, and just uh, I think puts you into the minds of pre-modern people in a really different way, I think, than some other topics can. Um, and I wanna invite everybody here to come back and join us again for our lecture on Sabbateanism with Hadar Feldman Samet, which is on Monday, November 21st at the same time using the same Zoom link. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day or evening. Thank you, everybody.